Hello, and welcome to the ALN 2020 Asset Leadership Forum, Restructuring America. I'm Nick Kenoki, the Director of Technology for the Asset Leadership Network, and I am very excited to be starting off today's event, Demystifying Standards and Certifications. Uh, one note before we begin, if you're watching the event, um, please feel free to write any comments or questions you have in the chat window or the Q&A uh, option in this Zoom webinar. And now without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dominic Townsend, uh, President of ABS Quality Evaluations and ALN board member. Thank you, Nick. And thank you everyone for joining us today during our session for demystifying the certification process. Um, my background a little bit, I am a board member of ALN, but I also am the president of ABS Quality Evaluations. And our organization is a global organization that uh, performs management system audits and one of the programs that we do offer is ISO 55001, which is the certification standard for asset management um, for organizations that really want to drive um, life, their life cycles of their assets throughout um, their organizations. I'm pleased to um, today to uh, introduce Reese Davies. He's our global consulting leader for asset management at Atkins Chair of ISO 55000 Committee. He also is the TC251 Fellow in the Institute for Asset Management. So with no further ado, Reese, I'd like to uh, introduce you to the group. Thanks very much, Dominic. Really pleased to be here and glad to be speaking to you today. Um, Nick, I think you're gonna run my slides for me. Yep, I will start them momentarily, Reese. Lovely, thank you. So yeah, as, uh, as Dominic said, I'm, uh, uh, for my sins, I am the, the chair of ISO TC251, which is the, uh, the, the international ISO committee that, uh, uh, that looks after the ISO 55000 series of standards. So I, uh, uh, I attempt to lead 35 countries, uh, which sounds very grand, but in practice tends to be more a matter of I, I prevent fights breaking out and try to make sure that some of the quieter countries uh, uh, hit, get their voice heard, which is, uh, uh, which is important. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Nick? So that's a little bit about me. I'm not going to talk about that. I think these slides get distributed later. Uh, you can you can read that uh, uh, to yourself. But the, the main thing is I've been heavily involved in the uh, the Institute of Asset Management, which has chapters in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, uh, my current role at Atkins and across the SNC Lavalin group of companies is as a kind of central center of excellence focal point. So I provide support to any members of the, the Atkins or SNC Lavalin group of companies on strategic asset management. So um, I've been around a few different industries, which means I know uh, not very much about a very wide range of things. So I think that makes me perfectly well qualified to, to be an asset manager. So uh, next next slide, please, Nick. So what I put on my, uh, uh, my synopsis for this presentation was I, I just wanted to talk about some of the big stories that are, that are occurring at the moment in terms of environmental sustainability and some of the challenges around that um, and, and, and how standards uh, can, can help organizations to start to address that. Uh, and I think that's a, a key element. I do want to highlight towards the end the role that, that our committee for asset management, TC251, is playing in in both capturing and communicating the practices that can, that can assure our future really, and, and, and perhaps for, for some of us assure, assure the future for our children as well, uh, which is possibly more relevant than, than our own future, as we'll probably make it. It's, it's about our children, I think, that are uh, critical in there. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. So I wanna start by just outlining a little bit about asset management. So it's, these, these are definitions from, uh, from the ISO document. So it's the coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from its asset base uh, in, in terms of achieving their organization objectives. What, what becomes challenging and, and what becomes uh, uh, kind of the core of this discussion is what constitutes value tends to depend on the organization, its objectives, uh, the nature and purpose of the organization and the needs, wants and expectations of its various stakeholder groups. Value in, in our asset management world is a complex beast. And, and most people, when they're using the language uh, uh, loosely, talk about only financial value when they're talking about value. But for an asset manager, value is about balancing that complex set 
uh, of sometimes potentially conflicting stakeholder needs. If you just do one click, please, Nick. I don't want to dwell on these, but if we think about asset management as, as addressing these four big areas, one, having aligned objectives uh, from the very top of the organization all the way down to uh, every technician wielding a wrench uh, on site, uh, but also across different functions in the organization is, is equally important. Then we come on to probably the most important part for me. Asset management is about transparent and consistent decision-making processes. Uh, if an organization is clear on how it makes its decisions and has the mechanisms to make sure that those decisions align with the needs, wants, and expectations of its complex stakeholder groups, then, then it's in a good place to start to do that. And if they're able to do that transparently and consistently, then, then they're a good practice asset management organization. Item three on there is taking a long-term strategic view. And I guess this, this starts to lead us towards that complex beast of uh, uh, environmental sustainability, but uh, I'm going to expand on that phrase as well. So whilst I highlighted that many people use the word value loosely and only talk about financial value, uh, I think many people are also now starting to use the word sustainability uh, too loosely because whenever I hear it, mostly people are talking about environmental sustainability and I think we need to talk more broadly about other forms of sustainability. So financial sustainability, social governance sustainability, uh, business sustainability as well as the environmental sustainability. And the last, the last view on the, this list of four is risk-based decision-making from a position of knowledge. So that gives us a neat link into the, uh, the big theme that's going on in our business world around digitalization because that's really helping to improve many organizations' position of knowledge. Um, and if you've got that digital part right and a clear understanding of what we mean by sustainability, and are able to balance those many conflicting needs, then, then you're in a good position again to, to use asset management to assure not only our future, but that of our children and, and, and their children as well. And next slide, please, Nick. So because ISO 55000 is a, is a management system standard, uh, and I noticed Dominic's uh, mentioned uh, certification, I'm, I'm not going to talk about certification much, but I do want to talk about uh, uh, some things associated with the standard and certification because I want to focus on uh, the role of standards in, 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 in helping organizations understand, share, and adopt best practice. Let, let's go a little bit back to first principles, which is why do organizations have procedures in the first place? Well, most people have kind of have procedures in their organization because everywhere they've ever worked has procedures. So there's this inbuilt tendency to think that we need procedures because we have procedures. But actually, a procedure is only there to manage risk, uh, and, and specifically to manage risks associated with achieving our objectives. So a, a, a good thing I always do with my clients or, or people I'm training on asset management is if, if you come across a procedure or a process or a work instruction uh, and, and you don't understand why it's there and you can't find a particular risk that it's managing, it's probably a good practice to challenge why we have the procedure in the first place. Um, Next click, please, Nick. So it's worth noting as well that procedures or processes reduce the likelihood of an event can occurring, but they can also reduce the consequences of a risk. So it's worth just thinking about that. If we think about safety risks, uh, the procedure that requires you to wear personal protective equipment is there to reduce the consequence of a risk. It doesn't change the likelihood of it occurring. Whereas you might have other barriers in place that do reduce the likelihood of an event occurring. So there might be exclusion zones or uh, protective barriers that prevent people getting within the danger zone in the first place, uh, reduces the probability of the event occurring, uh, and then your PPE present reduces the consequence of a risk. And, and I always like to uh, remind people that different procedures either reduce likelihood or they reduce consequence, and some procedures can reduce both. Uh, one click, please, Nick just because it's an exciting graphic and my power of PowerPoint is, is unbelievable. Um, so that leads on, if we understand the procedures are about controlling risks, uh, that begs the question of what is a management system? And, and in its simplest term, a management system is just the entire collection of procedures that an organization uses to manage its collection of returned risks. It's how we understand that we are in control of all the things that might 
get in the way of us achieving our organizational objectives. And I, and I like to make this point frequently because lots of people get very hung up on management systems and think that a management system is something big and clever, but actually it's just a bag of procedures that we're using to control and manage our collection of return risks to a level where we're happy to tolerate that. And don't forget that, I think. Uh, one click, please, Nick. And what this looks like in practice, one click. So most organizations have various collections of procedures. You might have procedures in finance to control fraud or manage people's expenses, make sure payroll happens. You might have IT procedures to deal with cyber risks or make sure that users are able to access the things they need or not access the things they don't need. We all know about safety procedures all the way around. And some of these have standards associated with them. So uh, engineering procedures are often based on engineering technical standards, which are written by organizations like ASTM and ISO and BSI or ANSI uh, are all involved in writing specific sets of standards uh, that often get encapsulated in the procedures. Um, and I think many organizations get hung up on the fact that they have, let's take for an example, a quality management system which controls their associated quality related risks. Um, many organizations will also now have environmental management systems uh, which control their environmental related risks. Uh, and if they're a well, well advanced organization like the ones we talk to, uh, they might also have an asset management management system that controls the risks associated with their asset base in terms of delivering their organizational objectives. So one click please, Nick. Now, what's worth mentioning here is that these management system standards, ISO 9001 for quality, uh, ISO 14001 for environmental management, 45001 for occupational health and safety, they are just a standard. They are not a management system in themselves. They are a standard that describes what a good management system should look like. And in practice, they overlap with all of these collections of different procedures. So I am often hugely upset by organizations when I visit them where they say, uh, and here we have our quality manual uh, and it describes our quality management system and it's compliant with ISO 9001. In isolation, that's not too bad. But then you go over and you say, and they say, here's our environmental management system handbook and it has a different set of procedures in uh, that manage our environmental related risks in accordance with ISO 14001. Now I think that's wrong Many organizations should just have all the procedures they use to manage their environmental risks, their quality related risks, their occupational health and safety related risks, all their wider risks associated with their asset base. And, and one click please, Nick. And I think this red circle here is the organization's management system. And if they are doing it right, and if their certification body is doing their certification assessment correctly as well, they should be steering their way through the organization's collection of risk management processes for finance, for information, for safety, for engineering, uh, and, and checking that they have all the necessary parts in place against those management system standards. And the question is, why is that important? Well, it's important because those management system standards represent the collection of what good looks like. What is the the good acceptable level of quality management? What is the good acceptable level of environmental management? And, and it defines a minimum set of risk controls, if you like, that you need to have in place to be compliant with all standards. It's, it's not something you should just blindly adopt uh, and, and, and claim I have a quality management system. But let's look a little bit at uh, ISO. One click, please, Nick. But just to highlight, the ISO is the uh, the international organization. It has 165 national standards bodies, and it brings together experts to share knowledge and develop voluntary, consensus-based, market-relevant international standards. And I think some of those words in there are particularly relevant. Buried in the front of every ISO standard for management systems is, is, is a couple of paragraphs that describe that all of these standards are voluntary. They're not mandatory. In some jurisdictions, you tend to find that regulators or governments might make them mandatory for some industry sectors. But, but when we write them, 
We are written on the basis that people will adopt them voluntarily. Uh, and, and the intent is that we are gathering the, the expert knowledge from the groups of experts, sharing what good looks like so that people can uh, understand best practice, share best practice, and implement best practice in their organizations. If they then seek certification, it's a useful thing for them to do uh, where it benefits some of their stakeholder groups. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. So what? So we've got objectives. Uh, for our organizations. Uh, some of those objectives are environmental, some are quality, some are asset performance, uh, some are financial. We have risks to objectives, so the things that provide a degree of uncertainty about achieving those objectives. Uh, and that means because we have risks to those objectives, we put in place processes to manage that risk. And then because all organizations have lots of different kinds of risks and lots of different kinds of objectives, we use management systems as the collection of processes to manage our corporate retained risks. And where we use standards, we use standards to communicate, learn, and influence good practice. Okay. So what about the big picture? I started my presentation talking about uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, one click, please, Nick. So what are the big trends? Uh, next click, please. So I think one big area of uh, trend that we're seeing in, in a lot of asset intensive industries and in organization generally is that trend towards di digital migration. So I've, I've got some images where we move from uh, the more traditional uh, dashboard uh, in, in our car and the controls we utilize up to, I think this is actually an image of a, of a Tesla. I, I do drive an electric vehicle myself, but clearly it's a Jaguar, not, uh, not a Tesla. Uh, it's a far superior vehicle. Uh, uh, now, I don't particularly want to talk about digital migration, but, but it is an important trend. Uh, it's an important trend which, uh, which influences quite a lot of things as well. The big ones I do want to talk about, one click please, Nick, thank you, is environmental sustainability up in the top right hand corner, uh, and also new financial models. And I think this, this comes back to uh, a hugely important part. So the top right hand one, environmental sustainability, I'd like to highlight that most people are using the word sustainability very loosely. There is a mention of sustainability. Uh, and when people are talking about it, invariably they are only talking about environmental sustainability. Uh, and, and in itself, that's not a bad thing. Uh, environmental sustainability is hugely important. But what it does mean is that we are seeing a massive focus at the moment on, on a single measure. And that measure tends to be carbon. And as asset managers, we know that most organizations, if you want to solve complex problems, you need to solve a complex multivariable problem. And being able to deal with that solely in terms of one parameter like carbon pretty much leads us into the same place or it's down the same route that got us into this place in the first place. I think if you are, if you are following a single variable solution to a complex multivariable problem, uh, you will not solve the problem. So I think that's, that's an important element. For me, sustainability is a multivariable problem. It's not just about managing carbon. It's about managing carbon. It's about managing social governance. It's about managing uh, financial uh, aspects as well, which kind of leads me to the one in the middle. For a number of years now, we've been familiar with uh, phrases such as the triple bottom line, which has been trying to get organizations to move a little bit further on uh, than just financial criteria for making decisions, which comes back to my, my other misused word earlier on, which is value. Usually when people are saying my initiative will add value, they are only talking about financial value. What I'm starting to see in various uh, uh, parts of the world and in a number of different industries is, is a slow realization that moving towards a more complex financial reporting standard like the six capitals model where we bring into place human capital, social and relationship capital, intellectual capital, uh, natural capital, which is hugely important, as well as the more traditional financial and manufactured capital. These things are coming. We are certainly seeing our regulated water, wastewater industries uh, in the UK and in other parts of Europe, uh, becoming more interested in regulating those industries using a, a broader 
integrated reporting framework such as the six capitals model which is becoming uh, more complex now to summarize some of these things on here uh, you will hear a lot in the media and from commentators about sustainability being about the environment and being about carbon one dimensional description of a multivariable complex problem when we then start to look at financial modeling uh, we're, we're seeing a, a slow evolution away from uh, the, the single measure of dollars, pounds, euros, yen towards six capitals. And that is also, therefore, a complex multivariable problem. And my argument, and I think where we're starting to see things develop in the standards community, is that asset management as a discipline uh, has a history of dealing with complex multivariable problems and balancing the needs of multiple stakeholder groups. Next slide, please, Nick. So standards, in my perspective, are a good means to gather good practice, influence good practice, and then also communicate good practice. So the problems like environmental sustainability in its broadest sense, not just carbon, is a multivariable problem. Moving from a single measure of value like the dollar, pound, yen, euro towards a wider financial models like the six capitals is also a complex multivariable problem. We think as a community of asset managers, we have a much better understanding of managing complex multivariable decision-making problems, and we need to develop that thinking both in our existing communities, and let's, let's be clear here, the asset management standards community has an audience, uh, but we also need to develop new standards for for different communities. And I think historically, the standards community hasn't been great at reaching out to one hugely influential group, uh, which, which is that group of financiers and investors. Next slide, please, Nick. Well, where we are at the moment, uh, ISO TC207 is the Environmental Management Committee. They have a long history of developing the ISO 14000 series of standards. Probably the most famous one is the 14001 Management System Standard for uh, Managing Environmental Related Risks. For me, uh, and I talk regularly with the chair of that committee, it, it's probably the only other management system standard along with 55000 which mandates a long-term view. I think that's hugely important. Uh, ISO 55000 we've got clauses in there that explicitly mandate long-term whole asset life thinking that forces an organization outside of a typical business planning cycle. I saw 14,001 similarly uh, requires long-term environmental impact assessments across the life cycle of whatever the environmental thing they're considering is. So I think they're the only two management system standards that explicitly uh, force organizations into a long-time, long-term whole life view of risk associated with the environment, financial performance, and so on. Second bullet is my own committee, ISO TC251. We're currently in the middle of uh, developing some work on complex multivariable decision-making for asset management, helping to capture what good practice organizations do in terms of balancing safety risk, environmental risk, financial risk, performance risk, reputational risk, understanding how organizations do that, how they get knowledge from their stakeholder groups about what their real needs, wants, expectations, and tolerance to accept different forms of risk are. Uh, and we're working on a number of papers in the background that hopefully in the future will weave their way into, into standards once we develop some consensus around there. Next click, please, Nick. And then there's a new committee, uh, which we're strongly engaged in, which is ISO TC322 on sustainable finance. Now, I think why this is important is if we go back to 207, the Environmental Management Committee, as well as the standards we all know and love on environmental management systems, they also have a number of standards relating to things like green bonds to encourage financial investment. But those green bonds, are, again, are very carbon focused. So it's a single dimensional measure of decision making. And I think that has its own weaknesses. We know that environmental sustainability is a complex multivariable problem and you're never gonna solve it with a single dimensional solution like green bonds. So what's happening in the 322 sustainable finance uh, community it is a number of interesting things. Firstly, it's drawing in a new audience. It's an audience of people who are developing the standards, understanding the standards and sharing best practice 
that involves the investment community. So we will see people like Macquarie's Green Investment Bank heavily involved in that development because they want to understand how as an investor, they can get assurance that A, they are choosing the projects and the organizations that are right to invest in, that are capable of dealing with multivariable complex decision-making, not just carbon, but across environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, and this is why the, the finance community is important. They want to understand long-term sustainable financial investment, uh, as well as reputational and social governance sustainability. So it's very much broadening it out to a multivariable uh, discussion. And I think this is, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I think this is uh, an area where we genuinely have the potential to take the good work we've been doing in asset management, link it together with the great work that the environmental management community has done over the last probably 25 years uh, and, and bring it together uh, and, and show it to a new audience, which is financial investment community. One click, please, Nick. CC 322 active engagement from environmental asset management community and the financial community. And I think for me, this is hugely important. It's an example of how standards and that worldwide community of experts can bring different disciplines together uh, and hopefully present it to a new audience. And uh, it's a small hope that we can leave a better world for our children and their children. I think that's the end of my slides, Nick. Just click one more time. That looks pretty good. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful picture of the earth to lead you on. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully, I think I was under time slightly, so that's quite amazing for me. Uh, I'll hand it back to Dominic. Reese, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It was very informative. Uh, we, we have a couple questions that I'd like to ask. Um, the first one, um, you talked a little bit about triple bottom line. Um, question came in, how do you compare the six capitals model to the term triple bottom line? I, yeah, you probably catch me out on that because I, I, I don't specifically compare them. I think they're just a different way of looking at things. Uh, the triple bottom line is, is looking at kind of the revenue side of things. And I think what I like about the six capitals is we live in a, a world which is run under capitalism. And I think by looking at capitals, different forms of capital, that's probably a more sustainable long-term way of looking at it. I think it, what's interesting about, I'm about to say something which is a generalization and isn't always true, but generally I find that if you look at P&L accounts in, in organizations, it's very easy to generate a strong financial return on any particular financial reporting period, but it's, it's much more challenging uh, to, to generate long-term position changes on the balance sheet, which is the capital element of it. Now, if we're genuinely all about a long-term solution, then we should be seeking to influence the long-term balance sheet. And the six capital model starts to look at different forms of capital on the balance sheet. And that inherently means it's a longer-term solution. I, I can generate a return in one financial year every time because you just cut something and you will generate a short-term return. If we start looking on balance sheet impact in terms of six different capitals, not just financial capital, then uh, <clears throat> we, we're starting to think longer term. And I think that's the, that's the difference for me. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you, Reese. You know, when I look at our, even in our own business models, a lot of organizations do focus on the financial model, but when you look at balance sheets and, and cash position, there's a lot of other um, areas that are important for your long-term long sustainability. Uh, making it a little bit more granular about asset management is like, you know, also how are you managing your assets through its life cycle to drive value, making sure that they stay running, um, keeping your business activities flowing. So there's a lot of things that connect together. So I, I, I agree with you, Reese, uh, on that situation. Um, another question, um, you had talked about um, case studies. Um, can you highlight any best practices that, that you've seen and that you've discussed in your presentation? I think there's, there's, there's a number of best practices now um, around multivariable decision-making. I quite like what a lot of the Dutch utilities do. Uh, I think in the Netherlands, they have a very open approach to discussing different stakeholder needs and certainly they're able to do something that we, 
we don't do very well in the UK, certainly in terms of trying to balance financial performance and uh, the one that's always difficult, safety performance. We tend to come out with words like safety is the most important thing, but in practice, when you look at how organizations genuinely make decisions, the words will say safety, but but usually financial performance tends to dominate in some way. And I think the Dutch have a very good way of being open and transparent about talking about how they balance safety with environment, with people, with finance. And I, I think the Dutch utilities have some really good examples. There's a there's, there's a great PhD thesis uh, from a few years ago from I think it was Delft University, um, where, where where the PhD uh, guy looked at. How, how the Dutch utilities had addressed that. And that's certainly an interesting piece of work. Um, and I think some of the, it's probably not care studies yet. I think we're in a position where organizations have done a lot with environmental management already. And the green bonds has been very useful in terms of getting a focus on CO2 related investment benefits. Uh, but the stuff that's going on in TC322 and we're not there yet, but we do have the finance community involved in the discussion, and we're talking about how we balance long-term environmental sustainability, not carbon. Sorry, carbon's clearly in there. Not just carbon, uh, but also long-term financial sustainability and, uh, and and other forms of environmental impact. We've only so I, I said I am an EV driver. You've only got to consider an EV and the complexity of it in CO2 terms. They're great. It, 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 the benefits case is easy. But I also know as an engineer that those vehicles are full of rare earth metals, which are polluting the planet in different ways that aren't carbon in terms of the way they're extracted from the earth. I know that many of the mining companies are probably using uh, interesting employment practices, which means from a social perspective, they're not necessarily great. We understand the combustion engine. We've done it for years. But there's this massive rush from combustion engines to EVs, which I think generally is good, but we still as a society have to address the other forms of impact. We're rushing to, to eliminate CO2. Yes, good thing to do, I agree, but we also need to consider the other environmental impacts, social impacts, long-term governance impacts as well. And uh, that, that's that's still to be addressed. And we, we have those discussions in TC322. It's one of the most exciting things I get involved in. Uh, perfect, thank you. Um, another question, um, do you include opportunity management in your consideration of risk management? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Uh, uh, you, you may be aware that there's a, there's a massive argument raging in the standards community internationally about risk and opportunity, uh, and I'm not going to engage in it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an argument of semantics, and for me, I'm interested in helping organizations to make better discussions better decisions about managing uncertainty. I don't quite care whether you call it risk or, or, or opportunity. And there, there is a massive argument in the standards community, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, Dominic. There is. <laughs> and, and, and it's semantics as well. They're just arguing all the words. We, we all understand we need to manage uncertainty and manage risk or opportunity, however you call it. Uh, it's, uh, it's becoming a barrier to the real problem, which is talking about where we spend our money to get best benefit. Very true. Um, there's uh, three main objectives uh, with this standard, you know, better control over daily activities, um, higher return with your assets, and then reduce the total cost of risk. Um, can you give us some examples, um, particularly with the higher return of assets? What are some of the methodologies that organizations will measure and monitor that? It's specifically on higher return on assets, so. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm not sure that many organizations do that well. I, feel, I still think they focus, so, so I work for a consulting organization. I know that my, my, my route of entry into most clients is, is generally about reducing capital expenditure or reducing OPEX expenditure. And, and that leads you to the asset investment planning and the asset performance management. I'm like, those are my routes in. They're inherently short-term routes, and, and, but, but as a person, as a consultant, I'm, I'm interested in making sure that they then start to think long-term. Um, I certainly have discussions about, with organizations about long-term return on capital employed, return on assets on the balance sheet are, are good measures, uh, but I think many organizations are still quite short-term, even those that are openly adopting asset management and talking about whole life costs. It's... It, there's still a step to, to get them to genuinely think about long-term return on assets on the balance sheet or return on capital employed. And it's, 
there, there are some organizations doing it better than others, uh, but, but we're still some way away from that. Excellent. Um, thank you, Reese. I think this was our last question that um, was posed. Um, I appreciate your, your um, presentation. It was very informative and uh, me personally, I've learned a few things myself. So uh, I thought it was awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And when you're in Manchester, give me a call. I will. I certainly will. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Jim Dieter. He's our CEO of the Asset Leadership Network. Um, he's been our pioneer leading this group. So uh, Jim, welcome. Hey, another great day. This uh, conference is really working out in a virtual conference, but a great concept. And really appreciate Reese's comments and the good questions. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do with this session is to help get people information about the different standards, like 55,000 and Reese, of course, expanded beyond that, which is great. Uh, but to understand different standards that are available and standard sources, we'll be talking more about that, uh, and different kinds of certifications. And it's uh, when people are just getting involved, it's not often clear when you say certification what we mean. So we've talked about ISO 55001 certification as an organization, which of course is, you know, uh, can have great value to organizations, but uh, organizations can pursue 55001 uh, practices without getting certified. Similarly, people can be asset managers, asset leaders, uh, without having a cert professional certification, but there's, there's many available. Uh, and, uh, the Andrew James Advisory Group, Richard Du Tavillian and, and Lindsay came uh, to the ALN a couple of years ago uh, with the thought of developing uh, a, tr a program around uh, ISO 55000 training. Because we saw that there was lots of good certification and training programs in asset management, but there wasn't one that focused on user level practitioner knowledge just on ISO 55000. So, ALN perspective, we try not to compete uh, with other organizations. We try to find ways to work together rather than competing. Uh, but we saw this as an opportunity. So uh, I was actually involved with uh, AJAG and helping develop some of the materials on a consulting basis. Uh, but uh, Lindsay will be telling us some about uh, those materials uh, and uh, the, cert the certification that we developed, the A55K certification. Uh, I found it exciting because I've, I've used this process, the training and the certification with clients, uh, and it has value just as individuals to take the class, absolutely. Uh, but the stunning uh, practice of using it, I believe, is to take it to an organization where you're starting uh, an ISO 55000 implementation and get everybody in the room that's going to be the key individuals involved. and uh, get everybody on the same page on ISO 55,000. Uh, it can save you an enormous amount of time and money uh, to get people speaking the same language. Uh, one example I was involved with, uh, we had uh, experienced quality person, we had experienced government property management people, uh, we had an experienced or a, a relatively new facilities management person, uh, we had some senior leadership people, uh, so a lot of smart people, uh, different backgrounds, and they, you know, they knew how to spell ISO 55000, and that was about it. Uh, and we went through this training class, and boom, everybody was ready to go. We were really, I can't imagine how much time it saved in our implementation, just having everybody on the same page. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Lindsay Ziegler, and uh, she can tell you about the training, because she is really... Uh, uh, the AJ and Lindsay and Richard Dutabilligan have really taken it to another level. So welcome, Lindsay. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to share my screen real quick here. Cool. Perfect. All right. So since you already said I'm going to talk about uh, training and certification, I'm just going to just blow right on past that slide. So I wanted to start by saying that um, there are two types of certification to ISO 55000, individual and organizational. And so organizational certification says that your organization is complying with the shall statements in ISO 55001, 
whereas individual certification, and this is what the ALN's A55K professional certification is, that certifies that the individual has a knowledge to participate in and contribute to ISO 55K asset management efforts. So my organization, the Andrew James Advisory Group, or we, we fondly refer to it as AJAG, provides training that qualifies an individual then to sit for the exam. There are plenty of other certifications out there. Um, uh, IAM and uh, SMRP have them. Most of those are more focused on asset management activities such as maintenance and engineering. So you will see things like um, mean time between failure, uh, mean time to repair, um, maintenance intervals, those types of best practices. And those programs and those certifications have value, but they don't really concentrate on the standard itself. Why do we care? Well, right now, ISO 55000 is gaining momentum in the U.S. in particular um, and in federal government agencies. Earlier this year, the Office of Management and the Budget, or OMB, re re released a circular um, dealing with federal real property management. And in that circular, they specifically called out ISO 55000 compliance. Um, that was kind of uh, good news to us because a couple of years ago, um, the GAO came out with a report that urged better asset management, but they stopped short of actually recommending ISO 55K. So we were kind of happy to see this OMB report. And the result of that report is that now federal government agencies and the consulting and software and other firms that have government contracts have become a lot more focused on what is this ISO 55K and what do we need to do? And as a result of that, professional training and certification is also gaining. So we currently have uh, 77 individuals that hold the A55K professional certification designation. And I expect that to be 82 by the end of next week. Um, in this year alone, AJAG has trained 50 individuals in three firms, and all but five of them at this point have achieved the ALN A55K certification, and the other five are scheduled to take the exam within the next week. One single firm, LMI, has 46 certified practitioners so far, and they've established an ISO 55000 community of practice, so clearly this is something that is gaining attention and that organizations are really getting interested in. So what kind of course offerings does AJAG provide? Well, of course, we have courses in both on-site and remote formats. At the moment, we're not doing on-site courses due to COVID-19. Everything is being offered in remote. Um, the courses that we have, we have a full ISO 55K slash A55K training course. And that is either four days on site, which we hope against hope we'll be able to resume next year, or a two week online hybrid format. And we'll talk in a minute about what we mean by that. Um, we also have an executive overview class, which is a brief for your executives who don't have any idea what ISO 55,000 is. It's a brief, uh, here's what it is and here's why you care. And then that leads into a one day ISO 55K summary course that provides a little more detail, including a bit of the uh, information about, okay, so now you're interested in ISO 55K, here's, here are the kinds of things that you need to think about to move forward with that. There is also a four-day on-site course offered in Spanish through our training partner in Colombia, Ortiz Ruiz Consultores, and you will hear from um, Daniel Ortiz Plata in the uh, ALN Español presentation, which is a little bit later in the agenda. We don't currently have an online version of the Spanish course, um, but we're gathering data to find out to gauge the interest in that. So if anyone has an interest in the Spanish language online training, please contact me and uh, we'll start to put that information together. 
So the course content, uh, the course materials were primarily developed by Jim Dieter, who just uh, spoke with us. And he was a member of the original ISO 55K creation team. It's the only course currently available that we're aware of that focuses on the strategic and tactical nature of the ISO 55K standards. And we cover the three principal standards, the 00, the 01, and the 02. We don't currently cover the 010 standard, which is financial management in the context of asset management. So we cover the 00 and 01 standards in depth and the zero zero is basically the why of the standard. It's uh, what are the benefits of asset management? What is asset management? And then a large amount of terminology. You know, Jim spoke about keeping, um, getting people speaking the same language. And that's what the zero zero standard does. And I'm, I'm going to apologize. I've got mowers out front and they're making noise. So hopefully everybody can still hear me. Um, then we cover the O1 standard, and the O1 is the shall statements or the actual requirements for compliance with ISO 55000. And again, we cover that one in fair depth. And then the course provides an overview of the O2 standard. It is primarily reference material on guidance and best practices, so it's, it's kind of like an encyclopedia. You, you don't want to spend a huge amount of time covering it, but what we do want is to have people who are looking at the standards understand how much good reference material is available in O2 to help them as they're moving forward with their ISO 55000 project. Another thing I want to point out is we don't use any outside materials. So all of the materials that we cover are from the 55,000 series of standards. And that is what is covered in the course. That's also what's covered in the exam. Now, when ALN developed the exam, they did it behind what we called a Chinese wall. And that was deliberate. The exam is completely independent of the course. We actually literally don't know what's on the exam. Um, if I had a I suppose if I had a photographic memory, I would remember what the questions were when I took it, uh, but I don't and I don't. So the main reason for doing that is to make sure that anyone who is teaching towards this certification is teaching to the standard and not just teaching to the exam. And we feel that's very important for the credibility of both the course and the exam and the certification. So we offer our online course through the Moodle learning platform. And this is a, uh, an online learning management system that is heavily used in the higher education space for presenting um, online course content. And our course includes uh, lectures, online exercises and quizzes, and then live instructor-led discussions that cover the online exercises and also preparation of a strategic asset management plan. And that is based on an asset management case study, which we have developed. Why do you want to train with the Andrew James Advisory Group? Well, we are the first organization to have training accredited by the ALN. We have a 99% pass rate, which is, we feel that's pretty good. Um, Taking the course gives you access to experts in leadership and strategy and in various industries. So you get a lot of uh, networking possibilities when you're taking the course. And we feel that that can definitely provide value to individuals. Now our CBT hybrid course allows for online training combined with live access to our instructors and experts. And we also present what we call special topics, which are one to two hour lectures, um, including one on federal real property management, data management and governance, leadership and change management. And we are continually developing new special topics um, as time goes on and as we are working with other industry experts. So I wanna take a second and just give you a little quick glimpse at the learning platform. So this is the Moodle learning platform. I've made it really big so everybody can see it. Um, 
as you can see over here on the left, there's a navigation pane. And then over here on the right is the actual course content. And we have a welcome statement. And then we get into the actual course materials. Anywhere that you see this um, piece of paper with a corner tab down, that's a lecture. So I'm gonna go click on the course introduction lecture. And this is what they look like. And then you play and listen to these lectures. And then you can navigate up there on that pane as well. So we have a, uh, a lecture on an introduction to ISO 55000 that talks about what the standard is, how it developed, um, and kind of the history of the standard and what it's for. Then we go through the core concepts. And you'll notice that we have, now here we have a lecture on assets. And then we have a discussion. And we ask questions that are designed to make people think about what they're learning in the standard. And then we have uh, people post responses to these. And then these are the basis for our live class discussions with an instructor. And then at the end of each major section, we'll have a quiz. And these quizzes kind of look like this. So you go to go into the quiz and you'll see there are true, false, multiple choice questions. Um, I don't ask any um, essay questions because I feel like the discussion topics provide all the essays that we need. And once you filled out the quiz, then you can take the quiz as many times as you want because the purpose of these quiz is not so that we can report your grade to your manager. The purpose of the quiz is to help cement your learning. Um, I do, as an instructor, look at the results from the quizzes, but I'm looking for two things. If there's a question that most people have missed, then either it's a bad question or we've missed something in our training. If there's an individual who is really struggling, then maybe we need to work with and help that individual. So that's the point of the quizzes. Now we come down here, we have a 55,001 section, then we have a section for 55,002, SAMP development, special topics, and then at the very end of the course, we have a review section session and um, exam review questions. Now again, the exam review questions uh, don't necessarily re reflect what's on the ALN A55K professional certification exam because of that Chinese wall. So our exam review is not like one of these, um, like a GMAT prep course where they're using actual previous questions. Um, it is simply a review of the material that we have provided. So that's basically what the uh, training environment looks like. So we've gotten some feedback here and I won't read it to you. I'll let you read it um, and these slides will be posted. Next up, uh, our next class is planned for November 9th and that's a two week period beginning Monday the 9th. Um, if you have interest in that class, you can click on the link here or uh, type it in or you can email me at lindsayz at andrewjamesadvisory.com. And that's my last slide. So I will turn the screen back over to Nick. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'm going to be quick because I know we're running short on time already, but um, Lindsay talked about the ISO 55000 professional certification program with AJAG. And I'm going to talk briefly about the ALN A55K professional certification exam, which is kind of the culmination of the course. Um, and on that note, I want to thank the developers of the exam, Marlene uh, Milamachi and Rob Labrant and Marsha Campbell. Um, they were the developers of the actual questions and kind of in charge of making sure the exam is something that tests a student's knowledge on the standard itself, ISO 55000. Um, so just briefly on the exam, 
Um, it's it's through the element popular LMS learning management system Moodle, which you got to see a little bit of uh, from Lindsay's presentation. And the main difference is uh, that we use Proctorio to remotely proctor the exam. Uh, Proctorio is a fully automated software that uses artificially intelligent facial detection technology and a host of other tools and data to really ensure a secure testing environment. Um, while protecting students' privacy. And so that's of course important because, um, you know, we wanna be able to administer, administer the exam remotely to as many test takers as are prepared, you know, in, uh, in case there's a, an influx of interest in the, uh, in the course in the exam, uh, we'll be ready for that because we have this remote proctoring capacity. And, and again, just, you know, wanting someone to make sure that there's no uh, questions leaking or you know other mat other materials being used on the exam. We just really want to ensure that um, our certificate means something and reflects the knowledge and understanding of the student that received that certification. So, um, really, that's um, all I wanted to talk about. Just kind of the exam being similar in form and uh, the culmination of the course and how we make sure that it is a test of students' knowledge. Um, and I think just for time's sake, I'm gonna pass it on to Rich Culbertson um, and he will start our, who is a ALN um, board member and ALN senior fellow. And he's gonna start the panel discussion now, I believe. Rich, you around? Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah, I wanted to do a, uh, just a few charts here real quick, just to kind of an overview, then we'll, we'll, we'll hit on some of the panel discussion. I'll get uh, that started for you real real quick okay. here, Rich. I'm, I'm also chairman of uh, A53 uh, Asset Management Committee. And Jennifer, uh, Tercy will talk about that a little later as well. Next slide. Next slide. You know, my name and all the other folks are participating. I want to go through, you know, part of this demystification. And so I want to focus on some clarity of, of certain issues. And I believe, for, for example, the definition of asset of ISO did it. It's 55,000 and changed everything. In other words, that definition, item, thing, entity, potential attribute of organization. I mean, tangible, tangible, very, very important. In most cases, we manage tangible. Usually, uh, you have the, the back office, most uh, the tangible by the executives. Guys will manage tangible. However, the officer had an understanding of assets. It also goes on financial statements. The cash is probably on this. Hey, Rich, um, yes. can, I, can I pause for a minute and just see if anyone else is, is hearing you or if that's my audio that's not coming in clear, Dominic? Mm, it's sketchy. It's coming in and out. Okay. Um, I mean, Rich, know. is there anything you can do to improve your audio? If not, um, I don't know. Exactly. No, no, I can't because it, it's uh, in my uh, my computer. I, can I get a little closer to that? Yeah. Would that that's what's better. Yeah, you know, it's been seeming good since we've been talking. I don't know what changed, but um, hopefully the problem won't persist. Yeah, I think closer was good and slower was good. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's move on then. ISO 55000 is different. It, it, it does not require the item to be tangible. It doesn't require proof for existence. Uh, it deals with probable benefit uh, or doesn't require ownership. One of the things that's really important in law is to see how this stuff can. And because my insights will go through the house, it's not that it provides value and stand out. I so the Uruguay Around Agreement defines standards. It's a building block system. And the standards is approved by an or organized body. Uh, that's a definition that the United States agreed to. And it's a conformity assessment. That, that is also uh, uh, important within it. They, they mentioned both of those. The whole term of voluntary, uh, voluntary expert groups produce standards. 
participant and technical experts then shall be restricted to person to professional standards and experience. Next slide. In the United States, there's a, as a result of being a signatory to the Uruguay Agreement, there's the National Technology Transfer Advancement Act of 1995 that created a law. Here again, within the law, they believe this is central, you know, to the economic, environmental, and social well-being of the country. And it defines technical standards, performance-based or design-based. Performance-based basically has to do with outcome. Design-based is how to get to the outcome. And it also refers to management systems factor, which is ISO 55000 management systems standard. Here's the kicker. All, and also always a big word, federal agencies and departments shall use, shall is a big word too, technical standards that are developed and adopted by voluntary consensus standards or organization bodies. And to carry out their policy objectives and uh, procurement and such. Participation technical of an expert is a voluntary consensus standard body. That is voluntary. Adoption of standards by an absorption may not necessarily be voluntary. Right. Keep that in mind. That, that, that's one thing that's hit me over the last few, few months here. Organizations are voluntary. I'm not paid. Folks on here are not paid to participate in this directly. Uh, however, Adopting those standards uh, is very, very important to organizations, and maybe they may have to be have to do that. Next slide. OMB circular, A one nineteen. You'll see the uh, the small B there. Office of Management. That's the management of of the government, the executive branch. And here again, here's the instructions to to uh, the federal agencies and the participation in the use of voluntary consent and conform assessment activities. Development standards on performance rather than design. That is important. Performance rather than design. Incorporating uh, reference in the regulation. Again, you can make a standard a regulation by incorporating this reference. So what's the policy for the federal use of standards? All federal agents must use voluntary consensus standards in lieu of government unique standards in the procurement regulatory activities, except where inconsistent with law and otherwise impractical. Therefore, it's important for, for those of us who are involved in standards to make sure whatever's in there is consistent with law and practical. We'll provide this on the, on the ALN website, you know, as far as uh, what this looks like, our references and such to this, so you, so you can get a deeper uh, view of, of what's required. Next slide. Here, I've created the essential government building block framework for a successful organization. And so when you, when you go to this, you go to from the bottom to up. And here again, you have fiduciary requirements. You've heard the word fiduciary a, a lot today. Here, here too, there are fiduciary requirements upon organizations that's imposed upon them. Mission, then my, my viewpoint, you go to internal control type framework. Usually that's either CASA or the group. GAO Green Book. Then above that, you, you have built in the assurance that's required. Uh, and that insurance can either be internal or external, based upon the GAO Yellow Book. Then you also review applicable laws and regulations, and above that, international management system standards. Then internal policy, contracts, and other obligations. And above that, you have to have the willingness to do it, the competence to do it, and wherewithal to meet the objectives. Those requirements are, are in there in order to reach mission success. On the right-hand side, as far as meeting requirements, that's how you, an organization must react to those fiduciary requirements. You know, things like mission, mission statement, create an internal control framework, continuous audits, identification and recognition of applicable laws, adoption of consensus standards, ISO 55000, ASTM 2279, adoption of industry industry standards. Uh, then again, incorporating this with things like alignment, requirements, assurance, policy plans, practices, process, and performance. And then eventually providing resources. Then assurance and mission success. Again, this is another way of, lo of looking from 
at this. Uh, it's a little different from some of the other slides. I think what we've all seen, however, all this stuff is true. Depending upon where you sit, you may use a different type of model. Next slide. And I think we are done. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Jennifer Tercy. And Jennifer works for ASCM International. Jennifer, are you online? Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for the introduction. I know that a lot of information has been discussed regarding certification, but I will be presenting E53 Asset Management, another form where standards can be developed and utilized and implemented. Um, again, I'll be going over a brief overview of E53 and how standards are developed within ASTM, as well as going over additional information on uh, ASTM as well. So next slide, Nick, thank you. So ASTM E53 Asset Management has been formed in 2000, the calendar year date of 2000. We have over 170 members with 12 different countries represented. We have 11 technical subcommittees with a jur jurisdiction of 33 standards. This committee is significantly active. We meet every other month via virtually, and the scope has recently been updated in the last year and a half. The main takeaway of the scope is the general area of the interest of the committee will include standards to support all aspects of personal property asset management, hereafter referred to simply as asset or asset, asset management, including systems for the management of industrial, federal, state, and local government personnel assets, as well as educational and medical institution, institution assets. The main takeaway of the scope is the work of this committee will be coordinated with other ASTM committees and other organizations having mutual interests. Next slide. Here's a list of all of E53 technical subcommittees. I'm not gonna go through each every sub subcommittee. Uh, we had recently just added E5305 asset leadership. Of course, we have a wide range of sustainability of property management, ISO management activity, and US government property management. Executive is simply administrative work. Next slide. One of the things with ASTM International is we are the one of the largest SDOs, but it's the scale of our involve, involvement influence that counts for more. We comply with the six WTO principles for international standards, development, transparency, openness, consensus, relevance, coherence, development, dimension. We work across political, cultural, and geographic borders, recognizing expertise, not country of origin. This promotes a massive range of activity and phenomenal exchange of knowledge, trusted and known for market relevance and technical quality. Our standards are the choice of many global industries, typically around 49% outside of the USA. We also believe in the power of standards to inspire and enable people and econ economies. Our global outreach activities increase understanding about standards and their application, and our memorandum of understanding programs provide intangible to developing economies. Next slide. Member participation around the world is what make, makes ASTM truly an international standards development organization. ASTM opens its doors to all interested individuals and organizations from around the globe that want to participate in the society's consensus process for standard development. This process ensures that all interested parties have an equal vote in determining a standards content. ASTM's enduring philosophy of consensus without borders helps make ASTM responsive and relevant to the needs of the global marketplace. As a result, more than 40% of ASTM's standards are sold outside of these states. Next slide. This is an overall WBS structure on how a technical committee would work within, within ASTM. Typically, you have E53 as your main committee. Then you have your subcommittees, which I presented previously. And then below that, you can form actual task groups. Those task groups can actually formulate and develop further technical contact to be projected into the subcommittee and then up to the main committee level. 
Next slide. Standards are published documents that establish specifications and procedures to design to ensure the reliability of the materials, products, methods, and our service people use every day. Standards address a range of issues, including but not limited to various protocols that help ensure product functionality and compatibility, facilitate interoperability, and support consumer safety and public health. Next slide. Typically with an ASTM, one of the things that I'd like to just reinforce is the time frame that ASTM allows a technical um, person to develop a standard. Once that standard is developed, we'd like to encourage ma maintenance on it, but that standard can be valid at any time based on industry, um, organization needs, or if information needs to be updated within that standard. Um, we allowed a mandatory five-year review, but again, that standard can be validated at any time. And that typically, we provide an efficient time frame to get that standard published. So if a standard goes through the consensus process, sub, main, and society review, typically, depending, um, that standard can be published within a one to two year range. Next slide. These are just highlight an uh, overview of benefits of being a part of ASTM. Um, obviously, everyone has a voice in the standard that affects the bottom line. We provide leadership training, uh, task group with peers, um, additional support for meetings, interactive with industry experts and leaders, and additional opportunities to conduct webinars and or meetings at any time. It's very cost effective with the $75 membership, which includes the free volume, um, instead of actually just purchasing a single standard. Next slide. Again, here's a general overview of different levels of balloting. You have your subcommittee ballot, then your main committee ballot and society review, and then the final stages of COS. Each stage has a check and balance point. So if a new standard is developed, it has to go through subcommittee. That standard will be open on a ballot for X number of days. So anybody that is a non-voter or voting person can review the technical contact and either provide additional comments or negatives. Negatives are never perceived as a actual negative term per se, but allows additional input um, to further enhance the collaboration improvement of the standard. Next slide. This is just an overall scale of ASTM platform for regarding balance of interest within a subcommittee and a main committee. Um, classified technical committees are required to be imbalanced. Voting producers cannot outweigh the combined voting user and general interest. This allows a little bit more of a balance between the two. This just kind of illustrates the scale. We don't want to have one particular organization have an overpower of a specific standard. We really want to ensure that there is a collaboration and balance between each sub and main committee. Next slide. Of course, voting rights and voting versus non-voting, one official vote per interest company all is equivalent to voting and non-voting members. So if you have a, all are welcome to participate in the tech technical discussions. All members receive a ballot and are eligible to vote on technical issues. All negatives are considered the same way. So if you do have a, if you are a part of a committee and you do not have an official vote and you have a negative on a sub or main ballot, that, that negative needs to be addressed that will blockade the standard so that the technical information needs to be appropriately addressed. Next slide. Um, member participation from around the world is what makes ASTM a truly international standards developed organization. ASTM opens its doors to all interest, interested individuals and organizations from around the globe that want to participate in the society's consensus process for standards development. This process ensures that all interested parties have an equal vote in determining standards content 
ASTM's enduring philosophy of consensus without borders helps make ASTM responsive and relevant to the needs of the global marketplace. As a result, more than 40% of ASTM standards are sold outside the US. This again is another diagram on how standards can be developed and go through the voting process. So of course you don't have to be a member to be in the task group, but you can provide additional input to the subcommittee. And once that standard is developed at the subcommittee level and proceeds to a subcommittee ballot, you would require 60% return required and two third voting affirmative required to move on to the main and society review. Um, the main committee is 60% return required and 90% affirmative required and society review gets it that allows everyone to review the standard and then the final review and approval of procedures is conducted at CEO uh, committee on standards. Next slide. This is a broad overview. If a negative is received on a specific standard, there are six different resolutions of a negative vote. You can find it persuasive, you can withdraw it, you can withdraw with editorial changes, the negative vote can be non-related, non-persuasive, or the negative vote can be previously considered. Um, typically when the, the vote is found persuasive, then that means that item that standard will be removed from the ballot to allow the technical contact and sub chair to actually revise the standard to go back onto a sub and or concurrent ballot to be reworked. A negative can be withdrawn at any time and typically withdrawn with editorial changes is very minor. Um, if it is technical related, then it will need to be re revised. Um, non-related and non-persuasive is typically you will, will require two thirds affirmative of the votes to find that vote non-related and non-persuasive non towards the technical contact. And previously considered is typically when that negative vote has been casted multiple times by, by an individual. Next slide. And I would like to thank all uh, ALN for their partnership, as well as providing the opportunity to present ASTM E53 Asset Management. All standards are important to develop and to implement. If you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to communicate with me or Rich Culperson, Chair of E53. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this is fabulous. It, it is a uh, very good effort in clarifying how this whole system works. And there's some differences between ISO and and uh, ACM, but they're, they're actually, in, in fact, uh, pretty well aligned. Our next speaker is Jack Dempsey. Uh, Jack Dempsey is a leader of TC251. He is convener of work group four on improvement. Jack, we'd like to introduce, talk, talk a little bit of your background and be wonderful to hear your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and, and this has been a great, um, great discussion. I will be done on time, <clears throat> and um, it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, the work uh, that goes into standards is just really uh, significant, and getting the getting the kind of a peekaboo view on how that works is, I think, important value to to people who are participating here. Um, <clears throat> Nick, do you have slides? I know I sent some things in late. Um, otherwise, I do have some talking points that I can use. So, uh, so I'm just going to kind of provide some um, additional thoughts on, on asset management. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> and, and basically, I'm, I'm an asset manager. Learned it the hard way how I think most asset managers learn how to be asset managers. Um, but I think one thing that, that kind of resonates here that we've heard a lot is simply billions of people today in this world um, are operating, went to work, <clears throat> or consuming or delivering services um, and products. Uh, based on standards, on ISO 55,000, or uh, ISO standards uh, more broadly across the world. Um, they don't know, and it, it's not really that important to them, but they know that things are working. <clears throat> so basically, what are standards? Standards are the collective wisdom of experts. Uh, they collect a lot of information, um, know-how, understanding. And there's a, uh, there's a kind of a famous African uh, proverb some of you may have heard of it before, uh, heard it before. <clears throat> but if you want to go far, uh, go alone. It, it, I mean, excuse me. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
So standards, and particularly standards that we're talking about here, is a way to go together in a, in a way that really generates a lot of momentum, a lot of understanding and know-how. By using standards, you're basically tapping into a brain trust that's tens of thousands of people deep um, and decades and decades of experience collected into those. So it's, it's, it's good, to, good to use. I think we're all kind of on board with that. Um, but really, I think the thing that I find most exciting about asset management standards, and we've heard a lot about it here in this presentation today and at other, uh, other events that ALN is putting on, um, they really promote innovation. Um, they help us understand with a context how to rapidly um, make use of and evolve new products and services. Um, standards really do focus on kind of decision making. Um, we talked about how there's a six capitals, a triple bottom line, it's not just financial, but really it's multi-criteria, multi-stakeholders. So standards are helping us do that. Having that foundation in our organization helps us get things done faster, simply put. Um, another aspect about the standards in terms of that management system structure helps us manage and adapt to change. It's pretty cliche, uh, everything's changing, the world's changing, it's become more complex, um, but how do, we, how do we deal with it? How do we manage that? Um, having the structures of management system in place helps us understand how things get done. So when a change is happening or an opportunity is presenting itself, we have a little bit more awareness of how to do that and what to do about that uh, to make it um, more effective and more productive. So um, asset management systems, what, what do they do? We've, we've heard a number of these uh, themes already. They improve performance, reliability, resiliency. What is, you know, and all that that means. We talked a little about risk and uncertainty in terms of once you have that management system, how to deal with these changes um, and, 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 and basically uh, make things happen better. Um, the ISO 55000 asset management standards, uh, two things I really like about those are they do focus on the value. And the value really goes to who are the stakeholders and what do they value? So there's that conversation has to be had and understood. Um, Reese and others here talked about a multi-criteria perspective um, that involves many, many people with many, many perspectives. But one of the things, and I probably uh, one of my most favorite um, um, you know, pickoffs in the standards, the 55,000 standards, is they're really not about assets. They're about managing the value generated by assets. It's a subtle, but I find it to be a very important um, theme and understanding. And it's important to, to kind of keep thinking about it. It's not necessarily um, is going to make you a superstar overnight. It's going to give you the tools to understand your operating environment um, and the value, getting down to that value equation. So I think it's, it's good to see um, the greater adoption. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. If you go to the next slide, please, just have some um, final, final thoughts on this. So, um, so what do asset management standards do? Um, or how do, you, how do you kind of structure the thought process around them? So first of all, they focus on objectives. All management system standards in ISO do focus on objectives. And I think as an addition, Reese made a comment on uh, the environmental standards on uh, sustainability finance and asset management standards have, I think, a little extra bump in there. And of course, 55,000 is focused on the strategy of how to apply and organize those objectives. Um, it's a management system, so it talks about policy and process. Um, that means lots of things, but it's basically the know-how an organization, the standard operating procedures that are used by an organization to effectively manage to those objectives. Um, <clears throat> Standards are also in the asset management system is built to streamline and organize the activities and workflows. So it's not just, here's a structure, here's a rule book. It's really meant to improve, accelerate, uh, motivate, um, organize, communicate, increase understanding, shared interest in things. Um, and that's uh, the activities. So it's not just, here's a rule book. It's basically now let's start exercising them. And that, that generates a learning process um, which is basically a number of feedback uh, loops. One thing that I find very important about the standards and as an asset management consultant in this area for um, a decade or more, is a lot of organizations know how to manage assets really well. They know what to do in terms of, oh, I got to do this next. I got to do a planning activity. I got to prioritize a list of projects. I got to go talk to the architect to have them or her, you know, her, her or him uh, figure out kind of what happens next and make sure the executive's on board. But in the end, um, the ability to do a plan versus actual analysis. How well did our plan work from last year? Are we learning about how to avoid problems in the future? I think all of us experience 
places where, man, why are we always here in this kind of, you know, this part of the game? I mean, I think um, personal experience in the federal sector, for example, um, so much of the contracting actions happen at the end of the fiscal year. And every year, like both sides of the equation are like, why is it like this? Well, there's a management system behind that. But I think if it's looked at in a way on how to organize activities, there might be opportunities to, to avoid that. I know a lot of people think about that kind of things, but that's what a management system is doing. An asset management system is really looking at how to achieve that in terms of the value generated by your assets, physical assets, intangible assets, and so on. Um, some concluding thoughts um, on how to implement an asset management uh, system and using the standards. The first thing is, um, if there's kind of a switch, you have to understand and accept uh, management systems um, there's, or a systems approach. Um, it's one thing to say, yeah, I, I kind of learned how to do it this way. I'm going to keep on doing this way. We're going to keep on trying to do it better. There's really an important aspect, and I think uh, Lindsay kind of highlighted that in terms of the need to take a step back and really kind of get, get your head together, get your heads together in terms of what do you need to do in terms of understanding the terminology, the concepts, and how all that works. That's a really important part, uh, but it also helps you kind of get your, get your game face on in terms of what you need to be doing next. So then you go about, okay, we're, we're an organization, we're starting to figure this out. Um, now let's, let's do it. Um, let's establish and use uh, a systems approach. Um, you know, and all uh, cool things, it's, it's, you know, once you get started, it's a lot of excitement, you start to figure things out, and then you get into the invariable, you know, kind of that middle ground where you're like, oh, this is more complicated than it is, and so on. But, but basically, one of the things that's really important about the use of management system standards is, again, focus on the objectives. Objectives aren't just a list of things to do or good ideas. Um, they are built in a systems approach. They're built in as prime motivators. You constantly go back to your objectives. You constantly evaluate how you're performing to achieve your objectives. Are there opportunities where you are able to overachieve your objectives or are you underachieving your objectives? What do your stakeholders think about objectives? Objectives become a central point, uh, central point in terms of that thought process and how you have those types of conversations. Um, the next thing is, is implement and deploy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work that's done, particularly kind of in the consulting area is like, okay, now you want to do something. Let's get it together. Let's start figuring this out. Let's update the policy, sprucing this up a little bit. It's going to be kind of exciting, stuff like that. There's an energy that needs to go into that. And we're all pretty familiar with organizational change. Um, you need executive leadership. You need um, like a wide berth of uh, thought, um, thought leaders in terms of your organization participating at multiple different levels. It can't just be kind of a, you know, uh, kind of cooked up in, uh, in a laboratory, so to speak. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art of participation. So you implement and deploy. The, the thing that becomes kind of interesting is, is as you start learning asset management and start kind of getting in, there's, there's things called like maturity um, um, continuums and so on. Um, you start getting good at it. You start understanding how it, what the balance points of the system are, how risk is being evaluated and managed. Um, and then you just kind of like let it go. But the reality is, is a systems approach is actually, and a number of speakers here uh, today talked about it, it's just the way you do business. It's not like that was, that was good, now let's get back to get work done again. Um, I think Reese made a couple points. Um, where organizations might have a quality management system, an environmental management system, and an asset management system, and then they're like, we're good. No, 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 no. It's, it has to be kind of the essence of how you operate as an organization, how you do things. So you develop it and you're practicing, constantly practicing, inherent to, to a system, management system, asset management system that we're talking about here, is a continuous improvement process. It becomes an active feedback activity. The thing is, is at the outcome of that learning, the training, the implementation, and deployment is basically now you're operating at a higher level. That's the expectation. And then that's where the real value is generated. It's not just in becoming asset management um, experts or asset management um, you know, practitioners or certified in asset management. The reality always is, is why did you start to do this in the first place? And ultimately, it's basically get to that higher level as fast as you can, use your organization, use the people in your organization to kind of think their way through that. No uh, two asset management systems are the same. Um, pretty exciting stuff. And the root of how all that happens has a lot to do with understanding how standards work. 
So I think it was an excellent uh, presentation today. Uh, really enjoyed the speakers, um, really enjoyed uh, my time here. And I am done. Over to you, Nick. Oh, thanks, Jack. I just, uh, really good. Uh, I did want to, uh, we were running a couple minutes, a few minutes behind, but Dominic, uh, since you have that unique perspective from an organization uh, doing system certifications, we wanted to make sure that you had a few minutes to, you know, to sort of tie that ribbon around it at the end. Now, I know there's, we are at our normal closing time, and if, if there's people that have to leave at this time, I certainly would understand, but hopefully we'll be able to stay on for, uh, uh, give Dominic a few minutes to uh, to talk about how how that certification happens. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, Jim or uh, Jack hit it on the head. You know, organizations when they adopt a standard, they really should be looking at the reasons why they're adopting it and not just doing it to put a certificate on the wall. Um, they really want to make sure that the asset management program or any standard that they implement is built towards the actual processes that they're operating and they're driving value and benefit out of it. Um, the certification process, it's a um, three-stage process. Um, first, we start off with the RFP where we ask the organization for various information about their organization and their scope of activities and what's included in the scope and boundaries of that organization. And from that point, we develop our, um, what we call our audit days um, on site and the, the audit actually is a two-stage process. Uh, the first stage is a stage one, which we call it. We'll come in and evaluate the organization's documented system, making sure that it meets the elements of the standard on the, on the surface. And then if there's any items that need to be addressed before we go to the actual stage two, um, we highlight those, those areas and it gives the organization an opportunity to um, fix those areas or, or put more um, substance behind it. And then we'll go through what is called the stage two audit, where the, our auditors will go out into the organization. Um, we do our, our, our core element pro, uh, activities, which includes management review, internal audits, you know, what your um, KPIs are and goals. And then we get out into the field and we actually see how the standard has been implemented. And we uh, look at the uh, organization, interview your employees, look at how um, assets are being operated and then making sure those are meeting the intent of the standard. And then if all goes well, we issue our uh, certificate, which is valid for three years. And we go in and do um, an audit on an annual basis, um, which is not as comprehensive as the, our certification audit, but it covers elements of the core processes and the core areas of, of the audit, as well as to ensure that the actual uh, management system is still operating effectively. And then we, and what we do there is we have an audit once annually. And then once that um, period ends, we go into what's called a recertification audit, which is a little bit more in depth. And then um, if all goes well, again, we issue a three year certificate and it, it follows the same process. Um, so we do have um, many clients that um, see the value in certification. And again, it's really important for organizations to develop a management system, which will drive um, re return on value, return on benefits, and to really making sure that you're driving continual improvement within the organization and get what you expect out of it. And uh, that's important for all of us to know. And um, when you look at ABS quality evaluations, um, like I had started earlier in my conversation, we are a global organization and the clients that we have within our group, um, we call them our partners and we really wanna make sure that they're getting the value that they, that they need. And they're not just hanging certificates on the wall, but it's really driving the life cycle of assets, return on investment, higher profitability, making sure you're understanding, you know, your environmental impacts um, and aspects as well. So we're really focused on those type of activities when you're rolling out a management system program. Thank you, Jim. Oh, uh, awesome. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, and, uh, a lot of information again, uh, and and we we are pretty aggressive in trying to fit a lot of information in. So we appreciate everybody uh, hitting the the key points and going forward. But a special thanks to Reese today for his keynote. It was uh, uh, really interesting to hear that perspective and what's happening. It's good news, and, and all the panelists. Uh, so hopefully useful. Uh, I'll turn it back to Nick, but. Uh, 
I think Nick, today uh, after you do your your close, we'll uh, leave the channel open for a few minutes to see if anybody wants to stick around uh, for a little open discussion for a few minutes and see how that works. Great. Um, well, yeah, I just wanted to show our uh, organizational member slide. Just never forget them because you know we need them for this to be possible. Um, and with that, you know, I'll. Uh, I guess we're not ending the meeting immediately. So if people have to leave, feel free. And if you'd like to stick around and talk, um, if you're a, a participant, we can get you uh, privileges to speak if you'd like to. Yeah, you know, just uh, enter something in the uh, in the chat and uh, we can turn on your microphone and or your video. That'll be up to you if you'd like to continue. But uh, let me, uh, while we're uh, seeing if uh, anybody takes us up on that, uh, Rich, do you like to share any thoughts on today's presentations? Yes, I, awesome. Uh, I think this is, I think one of the best panels we've had in a long time. I mean, we have certainly have the, 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 the key people, uh, the right information, and hopefully we can do a re good recording of it and be available for others to see this. Again, really necessary information, things that should, uh, folks should know, but excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I had the same sentiments as Richard. I thought this uh, session was excellent, well, as long as, as well as some of the others. And, um, you know, it's really important as, as we, you know, talk about the activities and the asset management, um, especially our group, there's a lot of value in this program. And it's exciting to see a lot of great people getting on and talking through um, various areas that we've noticed in our own business activities. And you know, I'm looking forward to the future as well. Yeah, there's, uh, go ahead. There are those perspectives. And each of those perspectives is true from that perspective. And so it's good to learn from uh, various folks that uh, how they're seeing the world and, and how they implement them. I think a question came through, how is everyone handling authorized use in the private sector? We have a huge problem with test equipment being used on unauthorized contracts. <laughs> um, I mean, I can speak on a, on a certification perspective as we go out and audit organizations if they're certified towards uh, ISO 55000 or any other management systems, we look at the quality objectives and what their clients are um, requesting of them. And that's part of um, the whole process of being certified is making sure that they're meeting um, consumer confidence of either a service that they're delivering or a product that they're offering to making sure that they're meeting the expectations of, of their client base as well as the activities that, that they're doing. Dameron, I think I see you're unmuted. Would you like to uh, turn your video on and or uh, say any more about your question? <laughs> Maybe he doesn't know his microphone's on. <laughs> yeah, I'll start off. Having been responsible for those types of situations before, there, there's various ways of handling it contractually and having authorized use. Uh, putting things on capital versus direct charge to, to where somebody else owns it and controls it. Uh, and of course, the training aspect of it, and there's marking uh, opportunities that can be done, but it takes a lot of discipline. It doesn't happen on its own. Let's see, uh, Lindsay, your thoughts on, uh, any thoughts you'd like to share? Okay, I can unmute, cute, cool. Um, great discussion. Uh, I, I particularly enjoyed, um, oh, all right, you can have my face too. <laughs> I, I particularly enjoyed um, Reese's, Reese's presentation. Reese, that was great stuff. Um, really interesting to think about the intersection between um, capital management and asset management and the environment that really uh, good food for thought there. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I think, you know, we're, we're moving forward and I think we're in an exciting phase where um, there's a lot more 
attention being paid to asset management in general and ISO 55,000 in particular, and that gives me a, a lot of uh, hope for the future. So, uh, Jennifer, how about you? I enjoyed each uh, presentation, a wide range of standard development. Um, it, it's always fascinating on what's being developed um, and how we're implementing it, going through different phases and what organizations may need and or require. Um, I'm the person that sits behind the, the, the lines of, of, of action. And even though I, I'm the tag holder of the TC, I know what's going on, but it's really fascinating to kind of see how other organizations, ASTM, ISO, ALN, and how each are very vital to um, the development process. So, but I thought it was very, very informative. Good, thanks. I just had to, in listening to the comments, I, uh, I had an interesting, interesting thought, uh, at least to me. Uh, with you know, among the recent develop, uh, developments and occurrences in our country in this difficult year, uh, uh, myself and some uh, some friends in a neighborhood uh, started a book club, and we started reading the book How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, which is a book I would really heartily recommend. It was a total eye-opener for me as, a, as an old white guy. Uh, you know, uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I thought I knew, I knew there was lots of stuff I didn't know, but there was way more stuff that I didn't know that I didn't know. That's true. Uh, really good book. Uh, worthwhile, you know. What is it called, Jim? I'm sorry? What is it called, Jim? The book is How to Be an Anti-Racist. Okay. Uh, actually, the man that wrote it's right from this area. It was originally from Brooklyn, but he's from uh, New York City. I think Brooklyn. Okay. And he lived in Prince William County right out here. He used to live out there. Uh, yeah. But the reason that I particularly mention it is he talks about the intersection of racism and sexism, racism, uh, you know, and, and other factors and, and gender identity and things like that. Uh, and the idea, I thought that idea of, this, of using the word intersections was a really powerful concept to uh, start to get to this kind of multivariable analysis that Reese was talking about. Not just to talk about one thing, but to talk about two things. And then, then maybe we get to uh, more complex questions of how those interact with other things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, today we are talking about the intersection of asset management and standards, I think, is a way to describe it. Uh, uh, we've had suggestions over the last, this week, uh, about other intersections we could have, about uh, uh, the security and infrastructure organization, CASI, I think it is, uh, CISA. Uh, the infrastructure uh, specific plans uh, around security and it's a government agency. That would be an interesting intersection. Uh, next week we have uh, our day on equity and asset management. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, I see the IAM has a program ongoing. It's great. I've seen some great videos they have about uh, you know, uh, equity in, in their own organization. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we are also making those kind of considerations and did so in the development of this uh, agenda this year. Mm -hmm. We always think about it, we thought about it more this year and, and make sure that we were, we're, we weren't blind to these, some of these things we didn't know. Uh, but beyond that, it's the huge intersection between uh, asset management and racism and a number of other social issues. Uh, we just can't deny that these have huge impacts. Where pipelines get built, uh, where you know uh, buildings get torn down to build infrastructure for other people, and uh, who's that working for? Uh, and it's just there's just so much there. Uh, 
uh, you know, Reese also, of course, talked about intersection with the finance, the intersection uh, with the environment, intersection with sustainability. And Marty Rowland has, you know, uh, opened our eyes on new ways to think about infrastructure uh, in terms of not the physical structure, but the, the services provide. It's about education. Well, what are the assets you need? Uh, what's the infrastructure you need to provide education or food in cities, et cetera? Uh, so I think, at least in my thinking, it's going to be a new, a new part of the way I think about asset management is about intersections and how we can, uh, you know, investigate those and learn. Yeah. And I think sort of the history of this is of the ALN and the uh, ISO TC251 and specifically the US TAG, uh, you know, were involved in, you know, the early stages of that and through the development you know, I'm still involved, but, you know, was leading it uh, with a lot of good people. Uh, but what was interesting about the U.S. group is we had so many different interests. And we all thought what we did was asset management. We weren't sure about these other people. Uh, but we learned to uh, capitalize on those differences and those intersections. Uh, and it really helped inform our U.S. participation uh, in the larger ISO 55,000 effort. All right, I've gone on long enough, that's all. Nick, how about you? What do you got to say? Uh, I Great discussion there, Jim. Um, I, I did also enjoy the, the talk of intersectionality between asset management and leadership and sustainability and kind of expanding terms like value and sustainability to to mean more and to be viewed in different lenses as those terms, you know, intersect with the environment or, you know, life cycle of buildings and et cetera. Um, so I, I, this was, I went to a liberal arts college and intersection, intersectionality was a big term that we discussed in the context of almost every subject that we came across. You know, we were kind of looking at how various subjects, topics, problems intersect with other ones and other user groups. And before we all cut off, how did um, Dr. Kofi Smith do yesterday? Oh, Fabulous. That was the best asset management presentation I've ever seen. Really? Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rich. You were going to say something. No, I just said he, he did a fabulous job. He, he incorporated a lot of things that were said today. And, you know, all of our charts were done independently, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing. There were some central themes, mm -hmm. like fiduciary. You know, there's obligations of folks to be able to. When you're running an organization. You have there's a trust factor you have to go through, and you, you can't you can't uh, do away with your fiduciary responsibilities, including accepting assets, asset management systems. You know that these are things that that have to be done. Yeah. Dr. Smith did so good, and one of my favorite pieces was when he was talking about, you know, people, employees, and non-employees as as assets, which seems kind of like a sticky, potentially issue. But his way of navigating that um, was so good, and and just his kind of central idea of like if you treat your people better, you know, they will be more valuable to you in a way or, mm -hmm. or increase value, you know, and just that thinking, I think, intersects heavily with ideas of racism and sexism mm -hmm. and uh, socioeconomic issues, all of that. Yeah, I mean, I've only met, I've met him a couple times and, um, you know, we chat once in a while, but he's, to me, he's just a, a really good person, you know, he's, and he's um, got a great soul, and he's, uh, to me, he's got he's got a lot of energy too. So it's like I was curious on how he performed yesterday. A leader, yeah, yeah. So Mike, your video isn't on, and your microphone isn't on. Uh, you get the last word then. I've been observing you doing such a good job of uh, leading the discussion, um, uh, Dominic. It is recorded. All of our sessions are recorded, so uh, we're going to be uh, uh, posting them as an entire panel, you know, an entire event. But we're also doing snippets, and we'll do an individual section so people can, you know, spend time with just one and then come back for another. So you didn't 
to anything. Don't worry about that. Excellent. I was in pre-op uh, surgery yesterday. I'm having my shoulder replaced in two weeks. Ah, uh, wow. good luck with that. That's an asset management on a personal level. <laughs> that uh, is quite incredible. It is. I'm going to a really good place. I'm going to the hospital for special surgery in New York, so I'm feeling pretty confident. Okay, good, good. Um, uh, I really liked the theme of this, which was demystifying certification and um, standards. And each of the presentations did a very good job of making things very clear. I think we'll be able to teach a master's course based on each of the presentations given today. Jennifer, wow, you just really stepped through that in a very methodical way. I'm so glad we've got that recorded because we'll be going back and referring to that frequently, I'm sure. I tried to be as concise as possible, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> and, and and you were actually. I was freaking out a little bit about time, but uh, I was like, we couldn't have stopped. You know, you had to get through that whole thing, and I'm so glad you did. And I'm glad we've got on record the um, statements you're saying about what is required. This is the law. It's not a good thing. <laughs> need to be doing this and yes. we can step up and say that with a lot more uh, courage of our convictions um uh and, and, so, and to answer your other two questions that you written to me yes originally it really you had one really good question um regarding case studies and whether or not we may possibly reviewed the duration and the time frame depending on the standard Usually that ranges between one year to two years. I don't okay. have an official case study to actually provide quantified information, say, hey, this is our average. This is, this is what we're, we're doing with X, Y, and Z committees. Um, it really comes down to the standard and, and the development process of it and how many negatives it receives. And sometimes a standard could be really good, but then once it gets to those other levels of other people reviewing the standard, it can blockade the process and the technical contact would either have to discuss the standard at a subcommittee level, at main committee level, and review the standard or provide additional input. So I, I unfortunately, I, I wish I had that technical information to provide, but it really is down to the standard itself and the and the level of participation and collaboration from the members. Um, so each committee is really different. E53, the members um, also with the TC are very, very heavily involved. And we have to be really mindful. Everyone is volunteering to do this. You know, their personal time away from family, work, and other certain circumstances and really continuing to participate and wanting to grow. So it's really great. Um, We're geeks. We're all geeks. <laughs> um, Jennifer, what's in the hopper? What is uh, interesting? What uh, is developing? What's exciting is, to you? Is specifically with ASTM or E53? Uh, e, you know, e, e, E53, but you know, whatever. Well, E53, I mean, right now, obviously, we're working on um, the new standard with Jim, which, you know, we have an action plan with that that's very exciting to work on and, and develop. Um, as always, there's different perspectives. Um, the scope for E53 has been recently revised, uh, and there's definitely additional opportunity to further develop and improve the standards within, within the subcommittee levels. Um, and we're also wanting to improve ASTM form usability so it's a little bit easier for members to actually access the information, um, review ballots. Um, there's a lot of changes that are going to occur in the future. I can't really specifically stay at this moment, um, but we'll definitely improve um, what ASTM is about, how to develop standards, um, and making it the process a lot more transparent 
Uh, sometimes we kind of assume, hey, it's right here on the platform. But again, if you're a brand new member, it, you know, it's, it can be a little bit challenging and daunting if you're not going to the platform all the time. Um, and of course, we're also looking at other outreach programs, um, MOU development, looking at other specific organizations to adopt specific standards. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of exciting things happening as a whole within the organization. So, so 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, NPMA started had the concept of developing standards for property management. And one of the, myself and uh, Lyle Hesterman and yes. John O'Shaughnessy and then Steve Michelson joined us and we're working on it. Uh, and then John did some research and discovered ASTM and said, hey, they know how to develop standards. Uh, we don't want to be a standards development body, I don't think, because you know, that's complicated. And uh, so we did that. And ASTM is awesome at developing standards. And their support staff has been uh, remarkable in a couple different ways, remarkable uh, over those 20 years. And Jennifer has done a great job as that, in that staff support role, uh, which includes, of course, the E53 standards, but also includes uh, the US TAG, uh, you know, administering that, which is not necessarily in the the favored sweet spot of ASTM, but is an important activity and they really support it, you know, wonderfully. No, and again, I really appreciate the partnership, Jim, and the long history with ALN. Um, I have the original news uh, clip clip of, of, of the newspaper, I'll have to send it to you um, from, from 20 years ago when it was initiated. So. <laughs> So. I have a little stack of, there was an article John O'Shaughnessy wrote uh, that was published in the ASTM magazine. Uh, and then we had a whole stack of, you know, print, you know, just, just that article printed out by ASTM. And it was called The Third Resource. Uh, it's a good article. And it might be worth, I don't know, is there any way we can, you know, link to that, you know, resurface that and post yeah, it on and our website or link to it or something. It was, it was a, it yeah, really other, informed my thinking a lot. Uh, there, I mean, within the, the committee documents, it's just those, that full specifically is just shared with the committee. Um, we can upload any, any past documents um, so that can be linked appropriately um, and or we can also promote it on the on on the public page as well as additional information to so that new members can understand the history a little bit better um, and the longevity and all the new yeah. standards have 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 gone through the ASTM process and continue to to be further developed and enhanced. So yes, God, it makes me want Thai food. <laughs> <laughs> I went out <laughs> to John O'Shaughnessy, spent many years in Thailand. And at one of our NPMA events, we took like 20 some people and you know went to this highly recommended Thai restaurant. And John O'Shaughnessy ordered for everybody. And I had food that I had never idea, no idea even existed and have not ever seen since that night in the Thai restaurant. It was, uh, it was something. <laughs> but I always think of Thai food when I think of John. And it's unfortunate. I know that we had our 20th year anniversary, anniversary, um, and both Rich and I had a lot on our plate to plan. Um, and and unfortunately, due to the unfortunate circumstances, we 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 postponed it. So, um, oh. so that that will be. In the works, hopefully for 2021, when we are able to safely, possibly, meet in person. So, your 20th anniversary plus one. I know it'll have to be uh, an inside joke. <laughs> Can you read it? Uh, right there, there right go. there. Right. <laughs> we see it. It's a ASTM. Uh, 
plaque and it says Jim Dieter, but uh, read us what the rest of it is. Committee 53 on Property Management System awards this appreciation to Jim Dieter in recognition of his exemplary participation in Committee E53 that led directly to the development of ASTM 2135 standard terminology, not standard terminology for property and asset management. June 2001. So that's, there's the connection. That's what I was going for. We can have the 20th anniversary of the first standards being published. Yeah. They must have meant it, Jim, if they engraved it in metal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if you guys are still doing these, but we used to, used to give these out to whoever is the task group lead that developed the standard. Uh, oh, Rich is getting my one of his. <laughs> <laughs> we said, we we are, we, we, anyone who developed a new standard, we, we order the plaques for them. We, got, we gave them to Rick Schultz and uh, uh, Marty. So yeah. Cool, great. We'll do that, yeah. I had to that off. <laughs> <laughs> Aline oh, looked at me when I, here I am in my, you know, downstairs office, and I started putting these plaques on the wall. And he's like, "Are you out of your mind?" And I said, "No, it makes me feel good. Those are, those are some you're telling me I'm a good person. Memories. What did you say, right? They're telling me I'm a good person. <laughs> I need that feedback. <laughs> yeah, we all need that. When my parents had parties at the end of the night, my father would say, "Honey, let's go to bed so these people can leave." And I think that if we don't end this meeting, then we've got seven people that will just continue on. So we should probably do the good thing and let them move on. But this has been a professional discussion that we will definitely uh, include as a separate uh, item on our website for people to be able to watch this uh, discussion. Well, I think we should, we should call out Amelia and Anderson and Cecilia and George and James and John and Madalena and say thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, and, uh, you know. You're actually you all it. made active now. So if anybody who is still on and hasn't said anything, especially John Shellness, uh, you've been a very active participant and this is our chance to give you some time to talk. But they all might also be off somewhere else and just need us. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually sitting right here listening intently and having enjoyed this thoroughly and it's bringing me back to my old days at McDonald's with asset management uh, as an asset management person um, and just knowing that that title um, back in the day it's very funny you know we we were uh, dealing with the fact that the biggest and most important asset to McDonald's were the new stores and I was in the area in charge of the existing stores and we've heard earlier today of that in between portion of the life cycle of an asset and it's been real interesting to hear the whole concept of standards and looking at it from a systematic strategic perspective and coming from a company called Strategies in Sight, I just love this. And so I could sit here and listen to you guys all day. I need to be doing some other work, but <laughs> I have enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Lots of learning and has me enticed to think about um, getting a designation even. Hmm, we'll see. But it was very interesting. So thank you for putting together a great, um, thus far a great forum I've really enjoyed it. And we'll this is a good chance for us to plug Cecilia, who will be on a panel next Tuesday for our uh, um, addressing equality and equity with asset leadership. And then next yeah. Thursday, our first ALN Espanol event, all in Spanish. So thank you for uh, paying attention this week and uh, for your act involvement next week. Yes, I hope that I can bring something to the table that will be as informative as what was brought today because it's been very interesting for me. Might not be as technical when you come to us, but some of that systemic stuff is still necessary in commonplace thinking and understanding which common sense is not always too common. 
and <laughs> the concept of simplification of management systems and breaking it down as you guys have and creating standards that we don't reinvent the wheel but have what great minds have put together and have a common thing across cultures that can be implemented is very, very exciting and warrants making sure that we all start talking about it and thinking about it. That's great. Thank Mindfully. You. <laughs> I think Cecilia gets the last word then. That seems appropriate. I like it, I like it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for allowing us to participate. All right, well, I'm out, you know, y'all can keep talking. Well, I think I have to go to work. All right. Oh, let's we need to. Bye. Oh, Thank bye. you, everyone. Thank you all. Uh, Thank just one you. second. I'm about to hit send on the email address you asked for. Not you, Cecilia. You can go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. I'm yeah. like, I don't remember asking. That was, yeah, yeah. That was for John. Uh, John, there's the email address. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so you don't, Mike, you don't need me on early for the four o'clock event, right? Mike's gone, but I, oh. No, I'm here. He I'm here. He um, actually, I've got a plane I got to catch. So oh. I, I'll, I'll take the beginning if you take the end. Okay. What am I going to do? Just be there for the closing and actually. How will I know nice. what to do? Then, then, yeah, you better show up at the beginning of it. <laughs> All right. All right. Great All right. job, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. See Thank you me. shortly. And thanks, Amelia, James, and John.